Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth uh, EELS webinar from 2022. Um, tonight's uh, webinar will be moderated uh, by Professor Stefan Renner. He's the past president of uh, EEL from 2014 until 2018. He's a professor um, at the University Clinic in Erlangen in Germany, and he's the um, um, Chief of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of uh, the Hospital Böblingen. Um, and he will present our tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Kiesel. Um, before we start, I uh, would like to thank our um, sponsor, Gedeon Richter, and therefore we'll play um, a short video. What does it take to make a medicine? You need to shift your perspective to see success comes from a series of innovations. Without the dedicated work of our highly trained researchers, no such progress would be possible. It is today that experts need to think about the diseases of tomorrow and premium quality requires the latest technology. All these aspects come together to create new treatments that will improve the health of millions. This is what we work for every day. Gideon Richter, health is our mission. Okay, so I think we can start now. Professor Renner, thank you for having you here. Thank you for introducing. Hello, everybody. Hello, my friends. I'm happy to see most of you again. Um, it's a beautiful day today. It's near Easter. I know the sun is shining outside finally. So I'm even more happy that you joined this very, very interesting webinar today. Um, Arlene Konstantin already said, I'm going to introduce Ludwig Kiesel, but I think we do not need to introduce you, dear Ludwig, because everybody knows you. Everybody knows that you are a highly decorated scientist and clinician. Um, I do not know whether people know where you studied. You studied, you do, did your medical studies in Heidelberg and London, as far as I know. You had your uh, board approval in the may I say in the 80s, somewhere in the 80s, because we do not want to talk about age. And we know you are a um, professor and head of the department of the university clinic in Münster for over 20 years now. And um, of course, you're a member of many, many societies. You are in the board of many societies. You have been chair of many societies, including the German Menopause Society, the uh, German Society for Gynecological Endocrinology and Reproductive Health, and of course, in the European Endometriosis League as well. Everybody uh, probably has in mind your excellent talk as key lecture presenter at the, uh, at the uh, Congress in Budapest a couple of years ago for the year, this was in 2016. And that's why we are really keen and really um, interested and curious on your talk today concerning maybe a new medication, maybe a new medication for endometriosis as well, but you're gonna speak about radiogolics and uterine health today. I'm really curious and I'm pretty sure it will be really interesting the next 45 minutes to 60 minutes. And I'd like to hand over to you. Well, thank you, Stefan. I'm very grateful to Professor Renner and, and, and Professor Krentel, as well as the EEL, that um, I'm allowed to uh, present you some of the data which are interested to hear today. Um, I tried to share my um, screen with you. I hope you can see it now. Um, Perfect, we see it excellent. So um, I am also grateful to uh, get in the region, not just for helping us here, but I think to be one of the very important uh, companies who are actually producing new alternatives uh, in, in many ways. And this is a difficult thing to do nowadays. So I think uh, we would like to support, to give them support that uh, our patients will receive best care possible. So, um, the talk I'd like to uh, discuss today is mainly on uterine health. 
Um, obviously, I'd, I would like to talk more in general, uh, but I can only give some introduction. But we'd like to focus later on on a new treatment modality, radiation therapy, or relugolics, and adback therapy. Now, I try to move it. Yes. So you try and find roads. We all know this disease, and uh, this is one of the most important benign conditions women have. It's usually present in about 50 to 60 percent. Uh, in the lifetime of women, and the numbers vary uh, according to race, etc. Um, but uh, what is important that these numbers are obviously very high, and we need some uh, how to treat this patient, but also to understand the disease in order to develop new things. And about 25% of these women who have the myoma. And the names are differing from uterine fibroids to so lyomyomas and myomas. So sometimes I will alternate between the names. So 25% will have morbidity. And as you can see this, from this old picture, it can look very many ways. And, and um, we have excellent ultrasound nowadays. And, um, but I can't go to, into details. But I'd rather go into the disorders and also the symptoms. This, patients will suffer and the three groups I've listed here. One is the bleeding disorder, which is also the main topic today, which is partially hypermenorrhea, but also other bleeding disorders, sometimes causing secondary anemia. But in some patients, there will be additional or just pressure, sensation, pain in the abdomen, and maybe there is some pressure on blood or bowel. And of course, we shouldn't forget that some women um, haven't finalized their child wish yet. So um, we are dealing with infertile patients also in some cases. So I believe that um, there is a big variation of these symptoms of the desires of patients and we need different alternatives in order to meet all these, um, um, these questions and also these problems that patients have. Now, if you look at how, how there is an involvement of that disease, first of all, what are the risk factors? The risk factors are quite numerous here. Yeah, some of them are listed in this uh, nice uh, review by Young, showing in the top the risk factors being race, as you will see, and also exposure to cer certain type of environmental agents, but also obesity can be a risk factor. The deficiency of vitamin D has been shown of course, age and also parity. Now, what happens at the lower level of the cell uh, regulation, which actually is the important changes which will make an evolvement from the left, which is shown as a normal uterus without uterine fibroid with normal stem cells. And this will change by genetics, by different hormonal systems, inflammation, epigenetics, different cytokines, growth factors, etc., which will change these cells to become uterine fibroids. So there's a complex um, risk factor uh, portfolio and also uh, different pathogenetic factors, which are important, not just to understand the disease, but to find new ways in diagnosis and especially in treatment. And we know today that there are different regulatory mechanisms. I'm just showing you for those who are interested to show you that myometrial cells, which are, can be differently changed. Some of them will be go, undergoing apoptosis, which will be helpful if they are, would otherwise develop to lyomatic cells. But there are all different kinds of other agents, genetic changes, oncogenic stress, metabolic stress, and, and many more which will actually allow a development of lyomyoma um, in some patients. And the important uh, understanding is that these myomas are actually clonally developed. So they, they um, uh, are, as you can see from here, with different markers on the left, that they are arising from one clone and then eventually differentiating. So what happens from normal, no, normal myometrium uh, when it becomes either myometrium, which is at risk, or it eventually becomes with, with fibroids. So these are these three different 
um, columns as shown here. Now the present understanding is that early hit in, uh, in, in, in women in, in early life exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, for example, etc., will allow a certain change of this myometrium to become a myometrium at risk. And then a later hit, which is listed up here with many different issues, sex hormone uh, dependent changes, alcohol consumptions, obesity, hypertension, etc., and even dysbiosis, which is shown today, that it will eventually develop to cells which will further arise in uterine fibroids. So it's important to see these steps and probably to interfere with these different steps. Now, today we haven't got the agents yet in, in total, but uh, we, can, uh, we can be sure that this will happen soon. So coming back to clinics, uh, as we are all clinicians, we'd like to know what are our options. And as I showed you before, many women will have different questions and different desires and, and different problems. There may be different sites of the fibroids, as you know, and et cetera. And you can see there are mainly three ways of interfering uh, with the management of myomas, and that's medical management, which we'll talk about today. And then, of course, surgical management we are, that we're doing also in addition. But there are some a rising number of uh, interventions um, by radiology to interfere uh, with the growth of these myomas. So when we concentrate today on a particular aspect of medical management, you can look at the different um, literature uh, studies. And there are about 75 uh, randomized control studies to understand which medical ma management should be the best. But you would be surprised to see how little evidence there is actually for most of the agents we are using every day. And that's mainly progestins and even contraceptives. So the studies are not really there to prove actually by scientific evidence that these agents are actually really doing something good in, in, in all respect, not just the symptoms. So um, if you look at these seven, uh, 75 studies, most of them will actually agree that SPRMs and GnRH analogs will be the most potent agents um, if they're applied correctly. Now, as you know, SPRMs have been uh, changed in the indication, so there is a limited use nowadays. So there is a kind of new focus of GnRH analogs. And, um, and that's actually where I started out doing my um, basic scientific work, looking at the, the mechanism of action of GnRH analogs in general uh, quite some years ago. Now, one study which I would like to focus today is looking at a specific group of GnRH analogs called the GnRH antagonists. Now, GnRH antagonists have been developed for several indications and now um, a yeah, publication shown for uh, the agent Relugolux, um, how to treat uh, uterine fibroids and also their symptoms. And in this publication, which is uh, highlighted here, uh, it has been shown last year, published in New England Journal of Medicine with a group of Alhendi, um, that the oral administration of this GnRH antagonist, Relugolix, um, especially in addition to combined adbacterol, which is estradiol and norethindrone acetate, you will actually have a, a, a really well-tolerated um, long-term possibility to treat women in certain cases. So norethindrone acetate, uh, which is all, also called norethisterone acetate, is in addition to estradiol added to relugolix. So if you would like to look up the full details, but I will go through the studies because this is the basis to understand and to use these agents. Now, GNG antagonist action is the first from agonist action because antagonists actually compete for the receptor and it's different from the agonist. The agonist will actually downregulate the receptor and you lose receptors. Whereas GNRH antagonists will actually compete with the normal GNRH. And it's a rapid action, so it will block the pituitary and thereby blocking ovaries producing estrogens. And we think nowadays that some actions on fibroids are estrogen related. So if you block estrogens, you will actually help women to treat their fibroids. 
symptoms and maybe symptoms like bleeding. Now, the problem with inhibiting estrogens are obvious. Uh, you, you can use it, but then you, you make women into postmenopausal women by just reducing estrogens. In order to inhibit fibroid growth, you can do that. But, in, but if you do it to a higher extent, causing a very low estrogen levels, as you can see far left, then the bone turnover will go down and you lose bone. And interestingly, there is a different response of different uh, organs like bone and fibroids to different estrogen levels. So luckily there is a therapeutic window where you can actually inhibit fibroid growth, but still maintaining uh, a reasonable amount of bone uh, if you titrate the dose well. Now initial studies try to titrate the dose of genius antagonists, but it varies for many women. So it's, it is quite difficult to, to use that inhibition on its own, although it's quite if, efficacious. So you can see from these slides, from this publication, and most of my slides are taken from this study, um, as which I will show you in a minute, that estrogen levels by using this kind of combination therapy of a GMH antagonist, Relegolix, in addition to estradiol plus, um, in this progestin, you will have a stable est estrogen level, and this is estradiol concentration shown, and they are generally between 32 and 45, which is uh, on the lower end of the, of the scale, but it's, it's still sufficient uh, to, to prevent uh, side effects to some extent, and also um, the bone loss. Now, I'd like to talk about the two studies and, and further on in the third study, which is called Liberty, Liberty one and two. And as you may know that in order to license a drug, you need to have two ind independent studies. So that's why almost the same thing has been done in two studies in parallel, more or less as a phase three study. And the main um, group of patients supposed to be treated had uterine fibroids, uh, and heavy menstrual bleeding. And heavy menstrual bleeding um, was defined at, at least 160 ml during one cycle or more than 80 ml during each of the two consecutive cycles. And the main endpoint, which is the primary endpoint point, was to have a proportion of responders with less than 80 ml menstrual blood loss um, per cycle. Or, and at least 50% reduction of the menstrual blood loss uh, measured by alkaline hematin method. And this was an interesting design because you had a placebo control study, which is, which is not very common. And, you, and then you have uh, as a second arm, relegolix as a combination therapy. So CT means uh, combined relegolix with ADBAC therapy, ADBAC being estradiol plus norethindrone. And you have even the third arm, which was um, uh, relegolix for 12 weeks. And for the second half of the 24 weeks, we had relegolix combined. So you would wonder why would you do this? And, and the main reason being is that to have an arm where you can have just relegolix on itself and to investigate the, the, the efficacy and safety of the ADBAC therapy. So thereby you had actually many questions asked, answered. And after 24 weeks, you were looking at the primary endpoint. So this was just the main endpoint, but secondary efficacy endpoints were different other uh, symptoms, such as uh, achievement of amenorrhea, uh, having um, the life quality index uh, measured and, and uh, investigated how, how was the change of hemoglobin and the pain score and also to look, of course, at the fibroid volume and the uterine volume. And in, the, in addition to the efficacy points, we had the safety issues to look at uh, safety after 24 weeks um, and looking at the bone mineral content as well as the incidence of symptoms such as vasomotor symptoms. So the, the eligibility of the patients were below 50 and, and mostly regular periods and having um, confirmed um, myomas on ultrasound. So vaginal ultrasound of course was used 
and it could be either subzero, serosal or intramural, um, as well as submucosal and with different diameters, or having a, a number of small fibroids uh, with a total uterine volume of more than 130 uh, cubic centimeters. So um, these were different. Of course, it, it allowed a different patients to be in, included uh, in that study. So a number of patients were excluded for obvious reasons, as you can see here, um, many um, of the patients who, who have undergone gynecologic surgery, obviously, or ablation procedures for um, uterine fibroids within the past six months. So that's obviously wasn't used, but also women who are having pathological findings on endometrial biopsy and history of osteoporosis, et cetera. Now the patient flow was the two studies showing uh, on both sides, randomized 380 to 82, the two Liberty studies. And after finalizing the treatment, uh, they were actually enrolled for a long-term um, investigation. So that was Liberty 3 then. So I will start off first um, with the two initial studies. Now Liberty 1 and 2, I'm showing you as, a, as, as in the original publication next to each other, just to show you the baseline characteristics. And you can see from already here that there is an um, uh, uh, interesting um, percentage of uh, in with race, for example, it's a, um, by European standards, pretty high. And the reason for that being uh, that the study was in both um, studies was carried out um, mainly in the US. And you have, uh, uh, an elevated BMI, as you can see from here, and um, blood loss was shown here um, as a mean um, of, of menstrual blood loss. So the first um, effect uh, we were interested in is obviously the primary endpoint, and that was uh, improving uh, heavy menstrual bleeding in patients. So Liberty 1 and 2, as you can see, they're similar. And um, gray being the placebo and orange being the religious combination therapy. So you have a proportion of women who had, had an improvement um, of their heavy menstrual bleeding was around 70 to 75%. And, and to remind you what, what was counted as improvement and that's being below 80 ml for menstrual blood loss and more than 50% reduction at 25 war, uh, four weeks. And that was looked at 20, 38, 35 days uh, at the end of the treatment. So there was a rapid and significant decrease of this blood loss, as you can see from here, um, shown for both studies, Liberty 1 and 2, and these being highly significant, of course, because um, the others had only placebo. So you had a um, significant reduction. And if you look at over the treatment period of 24 weeks, you can see that there is a, after uh, at one month, you have already a significant uh, decrease in menstrual blood loss. Now, amenorrhea was achieved in 52% or 50% in this study, which is not, not being 100%. So it is, it is 52 and 50%. So half of the women will have, have amenorrhea in these both studies. And patients of complain uh, um, about pain, um, which can be uh, related to uterine fibroids. So um, you can see that there was a significant uh, proportion of, of women who had a, um, a better uh, pain score um, after treatment with combination therapy. Now, it's important to see what how patients report these symptoms. And you can see from here that um, in, in both study and studies at week 12 and 24, we have a, a reasonable um, improvement of, of the symptom scale in both um, studies. But if you look at the um, quality of life um, issues in different um, symptoms and um, you can see that they are affected 
all in in a in a good way, but they are not all in a, uh, to the same extent. So, like general concerns and activities were uh, more more influenced better than, for example, sexual function, which is obviously not always um, uh, a problem in in these cases. So you can see from here that if you look at important um, problems patients uh, report that you can have a benefit after these treatments. Now, I think this is something quite interesting, but um, I, I don't think we have the full explanation. We will, the, in this study, it was um, looked at the uterine fibroid volume, which is on the left for liberty one and two, and you can see on the right, utri uterine volume, so the whole uterus itself. And you can see by the statistics here that you have only in that group really significant change Although if you look at the graph here, there is a tendency towards the uh, same effect, but uterine volume will be significantly decreased as shown here uh, after um, uh, treatment, this treatment period of 24 weeks. I, I guess um, uh, what I would think is that due to uh, the, the wider range of variation, I would think is probably one of the main reasons why uterine fibroid volume change is not significant in this in this study? So I I'm not not terribly sure, but I I think these volumes to measurement and so on there is a bigger variation than the entire uterus. So I think it's technically it could be a technical problem on one hand, but it could be also um, biology, of course. So we're all very uh, interested to see what happens if you use gene rich analogs. And in this case, we'd, we'd add that. You can see as a summary of, of all the adverse effects that um, the different groups were about similar, but not entirely because you, you see from this graph, the gray one is a placebo group. The orange is uh, the red oligolis combination with add back. But here you can see in this blue one, uh, the delayed relic uh, combination therapy. So you, these patients had no add back in the first two, 12 weeks. So they obviously should be different. And that's probably the main reason why there was somewhat higher percentage in these women um, leading to a discontinuation of the treatment. And I will show you later on um, that, uh, what flushes may be the reason. So in general, otherwise, um, um, these uh, effects are comparable. Now let's look at the different adverse effects. And obviously, GnRH analog sup suppressed uh, estradiol production will lead to hot flushes. And in, in the patients who had delayed add back, they had obviously a much higher hot flush rate than the other ones. And you can see from here, placebo has 8%, um, relugol is at 11, and delayed at back with relugol is at 36%. So there is some difference, although, um, and there is um, quite a similarity between placebo and relugol. So it's not, not a major difference, uh, but there may be some effect. And Another important issue is because another GNH antagonist had the problem of having some issues with hypertension. And, and there is some changes, but not much. So for example, in that study, there is no difference in here. Uh, you, could, you may uh, think um, that there is some difference, but there was no increase in the mean systolic and diastolic pressures. So that's something which I think is important, but arthralgia, for example, is something very important for patients who are in ungenerative agonists. And as you can see from here, there is no real big difference in the percentage of these patients. So patients are very much interested in these side effects, especially since we are dealing with benign conditions. It's not malignancy where you're using ungenerative antagonists or agonists. Now, one of the main measurable changes are obviously bone mineral density and, and bone mineral density loss. 
Uh, you can measure it uh, with DEXA at different parts of the body. Mainly, it's done generally on the lumbar spine or, uh, or can be done other places. And you can see here that there may be some little change as shown here with Liberty 1 and 2, um, mostly here. Um, but you have to know that actually here you had included um, both um, patient groups, even the ones with, gene, with uh, GNH antagonists alone, and then delayed add back. So I guess some of them are included here. And if you look at uh, on the timeline, you see that there is uh, Liberty 1 and Liberty 2. Um, there is ma no major changes on the whole. And if you look at the distribution of changes, um, there is some variation, as you know, um, measurement variations uh, is, is not, not very little actually. It's some percentage you, you have um, and from changes from baseline. So if you look at, at this graph, you, could, you would say that there's quite, quite an overlap. So the, the whole program actually uh, in summary uh, could demonstrate that there was a, a really sig uh, significant clinically meaningful improvement of, of uh, bleeding uh, if you compare it to placebo. So that's something important. And you can see that there was higher rates of amenorrhea, improvement of pain, improvement of hemoglobin, and also patient reported outcomes. And there was a reduction of uterine volume, but as I pointed out, there was no significant reduction of the uterine fibroids, although there was some, some visible changes or reduction but not statistically significant uh, in that studies. So the, the main issue with GNH ag agonists uh, is or was uh, tolerability of this ter therapy. And by using this ad bag, obviously there was um, a comparable rate of hot flush uh, in, in, in the treatment group as compared to the um, placebo group. And there was a uh, a reasonable maintenance of bone mineral density. So that's, that's very helpful um, if you use an uh, antagonist together with that back. Now, the question is, we don't just want to have treatment for that short period of time. We want to go beyond that. And so there's a program developed in, in order to look at patients after this study I've been just showing to you, Liberty 1 and 2, the two, two studies which are mainly similar or same. And um, I showed you the placebo control trial. And then there was um, a, a step whereby you have 28 weeks uh, just religolics in all these patients. So these are all three groups ended up for the further 28 weeks having receiving the combined therapy religolics and estradiol plus uh, norethindrone acetate. And this will eventually, sorry, this will eventually go on a further uh, long-term treatment. So I'm going to show you some more of this extension because we're interested to see how we're able to extend the treatment. So we are looking at these patients who are enrolled after they have finished Liberty 1 and or 2. So again, here, this has been studied here for a race, as you, you can see from here. Um, much more difference for the other slides. But again, you can see here that of, at the extension, and that's the extension study at, at week 52. So these are additional 28 weeks uh, treated. And you can see that you, can, you have here uh, the three groups, uh, the one who started out with placebo initially and then got arilogolics. Um, they caught up but not total, not entirely to that uh, level as religolox therapy itself. And there were also a group which had religolox alone uh, without that back and then switching to religolox and for the extension again, religolox um, and with that back. So there was a slight difference maybe, but I think um, it was very efficacious. And most patients achieved amenorrhea after 52 weeks uh, during this treatment period. And these are similar uh, findings that I've shown you before. So we are quite happy with the effect. 
So if you look at um, menstrual blood loss, uh, how it was reduced, and menstrual blood loss reduced by 90% at, nine, at 52 weeks. So these are shown the changes um, from baseline, right? So if the, in, the, in the left, you have um, um, the starting point of the baseline, and then having 24 weeks of treatment period, which was the initial randomized study. So these are randomized treatments here, the controls. And then you have the extension period from 25 work weeks to 52. So you have a uh, quite a, a range. And here, all three groups had the same treatment. So you, you can see that this keeps, uh, it's an ongoing reduction of uh, menstrual blood loss volume. And if you see, look at the uh, hemoglobin concentrations, whether this really changes, and you can see that this is starting with a baseline, and you have the three different groups, and then eventually it's, it's going up in, in all three groups, especially during the extension period, as shown here. And at the end, they have all relicolics in combination with ADVAC. So the summary um, of this extension, so this is the period after the initial randomized part. You can see here that um, you have um, um, quite a high percentage of different types of adverse effects. You can see because here you have not just placebo, which was initially given, but then all patients had in the end relicolics um, with a, with um, administration of ADVAC. So you, you have now different uh, setting. Uh, you don't have just a placebo only arm. And you can see that the, the three groups are about the same and headache being uh, quite, quite common. So there was no safety signal reported for the religious combination therapy over the 50 weeks of treatment. Now again, what happens to the bone? Um, I showed you the data before, which was up to here, and, and then the extension, and then you can see from here that um, there will be um, kind of a, a similar changes and going to, um, to the end point, which was uh, close to the initial baseline at that part here. And um, this, these are the patients down here who had initially um, religious only treatment for the first 12 weeks, you can see the drop. And then um, in the, the second part of, the, of that randomized treatment period, they had add back. So they stayed just like it, it was, but, but below the initial baseline. And after the further treatment plus add back, there was no major change. So there was, still a little lower than that. So the present modality of treatment would be obviously this year. So um, that would be the better option. So I'd like to end up and I hope um, um, I made clear to you that we have several issues from using GNH antagonists or lugolics in combination with ADVAC, having administered Isodala as one milligram and, and norethristerone uh, acetate. And in women with heavy menstrual bleeding associated with uterine fibroids. And this treatment led to significant reduction of menstrual blood loss volume, reduction in pain, improvement of anemia, reduction of uterine volume, but not significantly the, the myoma itself, um, at least um, in these studies. And this was maintained over 52 weeks of treatment. No safety concern, we identified a long-term treatment. And the main, main issue for the combination therapy was that there was the bone mass was pre preserved. So as a conclusion of the conclusion would be that religious combination therapy represents a potential new long-term treatment for women with heavy menstrual bleeding associated with uterine fibroids. So hopefully um, the, uh, the new era with the GNRH antagonists will, will give us some uh, long-term treatments and especially 
with, 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 with a lot of data, as I've shown you here today. And it's too surprising that a lot of other treatments have not been well investigated. And I hope there will be some studies in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation, Ludwig. Um, there was one question in the chat um, concerning fibroids before we start maybe talking about endometrials and other endometrials. So the question was, does it make sense to give the uh, therapy after surgery to prevent a relapse of fibroids? Well, I think this is the big hope. That's why I showed you the slides of the basic studies, how, how actually these myomas develop. And I think that's the reason why you're asking. Um, in the second phase of myoma development, potentially we need drugs to prevent. And I, I think in some women that will be a prevention, especially if you reuse uterine volume, because this is, I think this is a kind of a marker for, for activity, I think. So, so that could be helpful. But we are uncertain what, uh, to what extent in which women you should, you need to do it. Um, my guess would be that if you've got a lot of myomas, that would be something uh, you would go for, and especially, of course, uh, in fertile patients. Do you know, or does anybody know whether? I mean, I know what kind of approval we have in Germany. In Germany, we have approval only for symptomatic fibroids not yes. for after surgery treatment beside you leave one fibroid left uh, one fibroid is left but do you know whether this approval is worldwide like this or is the reeco approved in all many countries worldwide maybe somebody can put something in the chat because i'm interested yeah in how... i think i think need, we need a little help because this changes almost every day um and there are um, approvals and these kinds. So um, I, I haven't looked at the chat if somebody has written something on, from. Not yet. I mean, the, com the companies has a, a wider range of information than I do. I don't follow all the countries. So, um, I mean, the US has been, um, was, was very advanced um, for, with GNH antagonists. So they have approved upon number. Um, uh, have you looked at the chat? I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe we, we can ask um, how is the latest development from the company? Maybe they can put something in the chat. Until then, now let's talk about adenomyosis and endometriosis. Is there any preliminary data out there? Do you have any impressions? What's your impression about maybe broaden the indication for uh, this product to endometriosis and other meiosis as well? Well, that's a very, very good question. And it's, it's obviously that we have a similarity using endometriosis where we have quite a lot of data uh, which has been sampled. But um, the occurrence of adenomyosis, of course, is, needs to be studied. And in, there, are, there are some preliminary data showing that uh, two things. Uh, one is that in patients who had um, been treated uh, with SPRM and, and it didn't help and had endomyosis in these, these were initial reports, they, uh, it was helpful to, to use this other line of treatment, which is GNRH antagonist. And, and these are stiff, totally different approach. I mean, it, it, one is suppressing uh, estradiol levels and the other one is being an, an anti-progestin or at least a modulator. And so, so um, it, it, it's a, it would be helpful to, to use it in these women. And, and on the other hand, uh, it's common to have adenomyosis together with fibroids. So the problem was to see if you using GNG antagonists, how, how that will, how, how will be the effect be, be altered by, in that group of patients who have adenomyosis. And the final, the findings was that adenomyosis, the patients who had adenomyosis in addition to fibroids, the effect of GNH antagonists was not changed regarding fibroids. So um, there is no interaction. I mean, um, it, it, it didn't uh, make any difference 
at least in these patients. Um, so it does help, but on the whole, in fibroid patients, uh, I think the effect on the fibroids will be probably not changed by adenomyosis. Okay, there's one question in German, and I would ask um, the audience to question these things in English as well, but the question is, how about hormone intolerance? Can I, I don't know what, what, what is meant here especially, but um, maybe it's meant, um, how about side effects about hormones? How about um, adverse events about hormones? Are there any contraindication in giving uh, a Relogolex in combination therapy? So probably the question is whether the adback therapy would have it would be of different of side effect and etc. So I think the the, the point of uh, of these studies where you had a delayed use of adback actually uh, gives some indication because you had a group where you initially had early relogolics, no adback, and then you had this adback. So you. If you would analyze that group, and as far as I understand, there was no major signals uh, and no uh, safety concerns. Uh, I didn't look at individual patients, but in, in that group, there was no additional safety issue. Now, the numbers are obviously uh, not, not many thousands. So, so obviously, as with many drugs, as soon as you go in, there will be always certain uh, new issues. Uh, so my feeling is that you could actually give the, the dosage use is, is fairly low because you actually want to have a small add back. It's not a, not a bit huge add back, but, but still, uh, it, I, my guess that certain women, uh, they would tolerate uh, Relicolux alone, but this is not, um, not, not what is marketed, at least in Germany. So I think in, in Japan, I think they have Relicolux on its own without add back. And um, there you would have to give add back in addition um, in certain patients. So I think in general, uh, the low dose therapy is, is a bit similar to the low dose you're using in postmenopausal women and you have a low effect, but uh, it's probably not the same. But uh, my guess is that in, in, in the long run, there will be women who may not tolerate it may not. Okay. What about contraindications like trombo risk of thrombosis or thrombosis in the family or thrombosis in the past? Well, um, this has not been observed, but um, I, I'm sure if you go, do it in the, as I show in the program, will go on and I, uh, they will be um, much bigger numbers. And, and I think there will be some uh, but there is some thrombosis um, per se, of course. There is a baseline thrombosis for any woman. And if you inhibit estrogens and then you add back a small amount and you've uh, controlled baseline and the controlled low level, uh, as I showed you, it was between 32 to 45 micrograms per ml. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a low range. It's, it's, it's not very low, but it's, it's quite low. So it's not a... Uh, not something which goes up and down. And we know from treatments with oral contraception that anytime you use, restart things, you actually add additional risks. And having that in general flat estradiol level, my feeling is that there will be a less than expected problem because you don't go up and down. Okay. Are there any more questions? Everybody can... Um... Um, unmute their microphone as well, I think. There's one more question from Berda concerning infertility. Are there already some data concerning infertility and treatment with vehicle? Well, I don't think there are large numbers where you can really say, because infertility obviously can be of different order, of different causes. So you would have to have a different groups, etc. Um, as far as I know, there are no big randomized controlled trials, as far as I know, but uh, maybe there are some studies who, who have some effect. There will be some effects. Um, interestingly here, um, the size of myoma is not, not a large difference using the drug. So that's what the st study actually showed. 
So you have not a tremendous decrease of the size. It wasn't significant. The uterine volume was significant. So there may be some effect uh, on infertility in addition. I, I don't think, it, it, not in this study anyway, but there may be some, some ongoing studies. Okay. I just know about some case reports or some personal yes. reports. So I do not know about any study as well. We have a little feedback in Europe. Um, Rieco is approved in all countries. In the US, it's approved uh, due to uterine uh, heavy menstrual bleeding due to uterine fibroids in premenopausal women. I don't know about the other countries. I saw some guys from Bangladesh in our chat as well. I don't know if this is available there or not, or if they can get it from other countries, I don't know. But it seems to be that very, very wide, it's already available already. Are there any more questions? If this is not the case, I think to summarize, we learned we have a very, very interesting product on the market concerning fibroids at the moment. I am pretty confident that maybe in the future, we will have this option for other diseases as endometriosis as well. We will see how everything will develop in the next couple of years. Of course, everybody is welcome to report about any side effects, uh, any effects, especially in adenomyosis, because I think this is the most interesting topic at the moment to see patients with adenomyosis and maybe fibroids as well, where we can give and where we can just try to give this product and see how pain develops, how bleeding develops, how adenomyosis develops in by ultrasound. But we'll see the next couple of years how everything will develop in this direction. And what I would like to do is to thank Gideon Richter again to support this webinar series in a tremendous way, which is in this times not like everybody would do so. So thank you very much to the companies um, uh, to support the EL last year and this year as well. And finally, I would like to close and like to thank you everybody to pay attention, to listen to the Kiesel and to discuss questions in the chat. Thank you. Alain, you. Oh, you want to present again. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, before closing the webinar, uh, we'd like to invite everybody to the 6th European Endometriosis Congress that's going to take place um, in Bordeaux in France from the 15th until the 17th of uh, June. Um, there's a standard fee if you register before the 30th of uh, April and uh, more information you can get on the EC website. Thank you. Thank you, dear Ludwig. Thank you, Stefan. See you soon. Thanks, Arlene. <laughs> See you next time. You enjoy your day, everybody, wherever you are. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Tschüss, Harald. Tschüss. Bis bald.